You're tuning in the Radio Movies, a special event podcast and collaboration between the Explosion Network, the Pop Culturist, and DashGamer.com. Each week, we'll be discussing the films from the Kevin Smith Viewer Skew Universe, our memories with them, and what we love from preparing ourselves for the up and coming Joe and Silent Reboot, which we've now watched. We've, we've watched the thing. This is the finale. Everyone get prepared. Strap in. My name's Dylan Blight, and Jody from the Pop Culturist, Ryan Benson. How are you, sir? I am amazing. I feel like it's been uh, 20 years since we were like, this movie will be out soon. <laughs> well, yeah, that was the problem. We all planned for this one specific date and then the worldwide release didn't happen and the nothing and then it randomly appeared for one day in Australia yeah. and then nothing. Uh, Australia got fucked hard on this one. Uh, and also here, Buddy Watson. We are one week away from being six months since the last episode of this podcast. It was like a TV show. Really? Yes, we are. It's like a TV show oh. that filmed every single episode, and then the season <laughs> finale has been released six months later. Can you imagine if that happened in Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad, or any other massively popular TV show right now? Fans would be livid. They would be tearing the internet apart, but that is the uh, kind of situation we're in right now. And, uh, you know, the world is kind of falling apart. Maybe, just maybe, we cause this. Kevin Smith caused this. I'm just going to put it out there. I do appreciate you putting us in the same echelon of, like, Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones. And thank you. Well, I really like Breaking Bad and I really hate Game of Thrones. So it kind of middles us out. Ooh, it's mixed feelings. Yeah. (laughs) I do feel like this podcast was doing quite well. And if there was any sort of people hanging on for the finale, they were like, yeah, I'll delete that. They're not doing the final episode. It seems <laughs> if you've we've hot, been if building you, up for the, uh, in. for this very moment. It <laughs> never, ever happened. Maybe we should have released like a two minute yeah. update. Like, Hey guys, this is uh radio movies here. And just letting you know that the distribution for the movie sucks. And uh, we're probably never <laughs> going to see it. Hey, that, that one guy that found our image in that Facebook group, he'll be pretty stoked about it. Yeah, that was the funniest thing. That it. Do you want to tell that story real quick? Because fuck it, it's it's, it's quite funny. So yeah. So uh, <laughs> I'm part of a, a Kevin Smith group on Facebook. It's called like the World of Kevin Smith. I've been in it for years and years and years, uh, and I've never really get involved in it. And then one day I just see Radio Movies rock up the logo that uh, a good friend Simon created. I'm like, uh, I know that logo, and he and the the picture was essentially, oh man, look at this awesome logo I found. I'm like, you want to know where that's from, man? Just- <laughs> You know, like, give us some credit or some shit. Like, come on. Yeah. Like, really, Hi, I'm Ryan Benson. You may that. remember me from such podcasts as so-and-so, so-and-so. And as this so- logo is from <laughs> yeah. so-and-so. Like, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm Ryan Benson. You don't remember me from the podcast that you're stealing the image of. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's like, it's proof that for all, all future podcasts that any of us ever do, it's like, it doesn't ma- matter what the podcast artwork is. Uh, if it represents a podcast really or not just make cool podcast artwork that mm. people will try and set as wallpapers so then you can like link them back to the show <laughs> eventually somehow maybe you know like it's a whole scheme thing um so yeah the, the the movie didn't come to australia uh for what seemed like forever obviously when we started the podcast last year it was like okay global release date maybe october Maybe Australia gets it a little bit after America. If not, whatever. We'll get it November, December. It'll be fine. And it randomly came here, what? Uh, uh, the January? 11th of March. Oh, March. March, yeah. Yeah, and it was in like three cinemas, I feel, over the entire country. Yeah, so it was, one, it was one screening across Village and Reading and like a Hoyts, I guess. So yeah, pretty much one Wednesday, like, hey, everywhere. It's today and today only. Get it excited-ish. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to admit that I was holding out to watch it in the cinema. Now, it never came to any cinema close to me. I've seen the movie. You can um, char- you can sue me if you want, Kevin Smith, but I feel like at this stage you can't. Like, Jesus Christ, my man. Anyway, <clears throat> figure that one out for yourself. But let's get to it. Ke- uh, Jane Silent Ball reboot. The cinematic event you've been waiting for is now upon us. I'm Jay, and this is my head on life mate, Silent Bob. Jay and Silent Bob are back. Let's go with Ryan first, because I think you've seen it more than once, right? Have you? Yeah, I've seen it twice, yeah. You've seen it twice. So you should have the most thought-out opinions on the movie. So did you like it? Did it live up to your hopes? How do you feel? Uh, first viewing was 
interesting. Uh, it was one of those things that like I took it all in and I, I did have to watch it again because on, on first viewing, it didn't really land as an overall piece. It was very interesting. I think part of uh, uh, doing this show with you guys, it, it brought up some points about Kevin Smith films I'd never realized before. And I found that they really presented themselves here in the way we talked about how every time he tries to a nice poignant drama moment, he back ends it with some comedy to really take the sting out of it. And that happens a lot here because he's trying to tell this really kind of thoughtful, thought, uh, thoughtful, heartfelt story about becoming a father, but then can't seem to separate it from needing to tell dick and fart jokes. And even there are some incredible cameos in here. Um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll go bit by bit in terms of the, the yeah, big yeah. parts that we like the most. But it's it if it is certainly a love letter to the Viewerskew universe. But I do kind of think that that uh, Strike Back may have been a better love letter. Yeah. So overall, would you say you enjoyed it though? Like you, you didn't want because I know I, online I've seen people either be like, "Yeah, it's great. I don't know what everyone expected better from it," and then other people be like, "This is the worst. I got so excited for nothing." Kevin Smith's a hack. Like, do you just fall in the middle? Do you reckon? I fall in the middle. Like I don't think I certainly don't think it's a masterpiece. It's certainly not one of the one of the best of your skew movies. Um, however, I, it took, it did take me two viewings to appreciate it. Yep. Cool, uh, buddy. How how are you feeling on those points? Uh, yeah, I think it's a similar train of thought. Um, my letterbox re- review is like a two and a half, so it's right down the middle. Watching it. That's out of five. Oh, it's out of five. Good. I was yeah, like, holy it's, it's, shit. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You don't go middling and then and, and absolutely trash it. So there was, there was some things I liked, but um, overall, it was definitely, I think I've used this it's so long since we've recorded, but I've used this in a number of podcasts to describe uh, similar movies, but it felt like a YouTube compilation video kind of just yeah. um, giving us the references of, all we've seen before, which is fine. And I enjoyed a few of them, but um, overall it really, I watched it and that was fine. And I don't think I'll ever revisit or have the desire to revisit it. And for people who have kind of been yearning for that more rats too, or more rats is now going to be a 10 episode TV series or when we see Jay and Silent Bob back on screen, I hope that for that has fulfilled that kind of need. And I really felt like this was the swan song for this universe. Really? I, I can't see where they would mm. go from here. Um, but yeah, so I, I, th- I think overall, I, I really feel similar to, I guess what you're kind of saying, Ryan, but I, but you do. Yeah. I um I think because I went in knowing that it wasn't going to be the an amazing movie like no offense to Kevin Smith of course but I just I went in with my expectations at a certain point so that meant I left enjoying it. I thought it was actually I would say I thought it was better than what I expected it to be to be completely honest. Like I I thought it 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 went exactly the direction I thought it was going to go based off all the trailers and stuff which is it's just the big nostalgia trip or whatever but it didn't cross the line into being too much that and not having anything to actually say like i think that the reason i enjoyed the movie so much was i actually really enjoyed the dramatic storyline about jay becoming a father and i really enjoyed all of that and with that being the core it meant that when the jokes for me personally fell to the side i'm like that wasn't that funny or that was kind of annoying or whatever like i i, I was on board for the core storyline of jay actually growing up and mm realizing he has to become this father by the end of it and that's makes it quite interesting to watch also that's one of the other things i found so much weirder about this movie is it's it's so much more grown up in a lot of weird ways and it makes jay's character quite weird like it's still jay however it is really toned down especially because if we really watch this like if we watch this the week after we did clerks 2 for example um with all the the rest of those movies really close in mind you would have been like wow he's he's not saying you know calling people f words and you know like like you know we, we talked about all that sort of stuff to do with the the character the the slurs and whatever self like he's toned down and i feel like that has to do a lot with not only 
Kevin Smith growing up somewhat because we've kind of talked about that before. But I feel like in a lot of ways it was Jason Mewes being like, I don't want to, like he gets to grow up his character he's known for on screen and like the, uh, uh, grow up as a person in in a lot of ways. So when it, when and when Buddy was like saying about the future of the franchise and stuff, it does make me wary but at the same time i'd be interested to see where he could take that stuff and i guess my my only big thing is i feel like kevin smith's at the point now like to 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 what ryan was saying before about the comedy stuff and whatever we've brought up before it's weirdly kevin smith's at a point now where i think he would be just be better off doing the majority of this movie and any future like clerks three or mole rat series or whatever else where the drama is actually the primary genre and the comedy is just there in more sparse regards which you may be like well that's not a kevin smith movie then like he makes comedies but you can just tell so hard that he wants to actually tell a much more dramatic story and he like a lot of the jokes just feel like he's like oh fuck i haven't told a joke for for two minutes so i better write one in here because that's the type of movie it is and i'm like well maybe you don't need to maybe just fuck it don't you know but uh, does it, does it, how would everyone feel about that? The idea of Kevin Smith doing less comedy and just more of the dramatic stuff. Does that I sound I would completely crazy? agree with you because in, in the same vein as the, the, the through point of that father's story is well, it's quite poignant to me because I'm a father myself. So that was what I resonated with the most. And the, the most impactful scene for me is, is around that completely. Um, so I... I agree. I think he really should give that a burl and sort of head into that drama space or some sort of, uh, yeah, not as comedy genre. Yeah. Yeah. Does that interest you, buddy, or are you like, that's not what I'm down for? Well, just, I guess, looking at my two favorite Kevin Smith movies, Chasing Amy, of course, that's drama. Um, Packed, <laughs> however... Um, Oh, lost for words already. Uh, you know, drama centric instead of you know the comedy offbeats of the rest of the uh, kind yeah, of yeah. universe. And then my favorite more is more rats. And even though that's such a quote heavy movie, and you know, I guess funny in so many areas, the through line really was you know they had this kind of simple premise for the story, and you know, which is kind of getting you know the long lost love of your life back and and making up for those relationships that you've kind of um, let pass by. That was really, I felt like that was the core and all the comedy kind of came around that where I guess with watching Reboot, I really felt that all the jokes were and the throwaways and the cameos were kind of written first and then the serious drama stuff was chucked in around it. Um, so I don't know if that's that's that that's the way it is. That's just the way I, I guess interpret it from watching it. I felt like that was, an, you know, the more the drama stuff was after four, even though that was the strongest bit. So yeah, I, I if it, if he does go through with that kind of stuff, then I would, you know, definitely love for it to be more of that uh, the storyline centric or, or first, and then and kind of have everything else, you know, kind of um, complement that. So wasn't it mentioned that sort of he took a lot of beats from that he was going to put in more rats and clerks three into this? So I have a feeling that emotional storyline, like being a father, was meant to be around uh, Dante, and like they've brought it into Jay. Do you think? I mean, it's possible. It's hard to keep up, really, with all the stuff he's cancelled and rewritten and whatever else. Like, we know for a fact that there was a Clerks 3 script. It was done. Um, Brian O'Hara was on board, but then Jeff Anderson wasn't. And then he ended up... And apparently it was, like, super depressing script anyway. So that didn't sound like a comedy at all. It sounded so, awesome. <laughs> and, and now, apparently, he's rewritten that and got Jeff on board. So I don't know if that means it's even more dramatic and that's what jeff wants or it's less dramatic and it's more comedy because that's what jeff wants but apparently clerks 3 was super down <laughs> which is quite a weird way to end a trilogy where the this especially the way clerks 2 ended um but for for this movie i i, I feel like maybe a lot of the jokes is just because it's jay and silent bob and he's like can i really like they are literally like you're talking about chasing Amy. The whole, most of the it's like Jane Silent Bob are really in that movie f- f- to represent the dick and fart jokes of the universe, or else it's not even tied to the Vilskew universe in a lot of ways. And the whole rest of the movie is just 
super serious. And you're like, oh, Jane Simon Bob here. So it's a Kevin Smith movie. Like Jane Simon Bob represent dick and fart jokes. So can you do a super serious Jane Simon Bob movie? I don't know. He could have tried, I guess. But um, the, the other thing I do wonder with it is that although I haven't like quote unquote grown up fully watching these movies, like as they've come out in theaters, I did watch them all from a young age and then have been a fan since then kind of thing. So it's, it's, I do wonder if his core fan base has kind of grown up a lot to also feel at the point where they're like, look, man, we, we don't need this kind of humor that you used to do as much as you don't need to do it anymore. You know, like he's, it feels like making movies for his audience 20 years ago. When you should be making all our movies yep. for his audience now, which have grown up, you know, instead of aiming to please, like, I, I don't know what the target audience is. It feels like the target audience is from the past kind of thing instead of the, the present, which is the, the one thing. But it's, it, look, I'm complaining a lot about the jokes. I will say I laughed several times. I just didn't laugh at every single joke. And I, I don't know if there, there's only a couple of comedies probably ever where I've laughed at every single joke. So that's not that big of a criticism. However, I would say it's probably closer to like 50, 60%, you know, which is, which isn't that great for a comedy. And even some of the, the stuff I was laughing at, it might've just been in my head laughing, not like laughing out loud, laughing. Hmm. Um, so before we go over, um, we can we can focus on the Jane Jane the Jane and Ty Bob stuff in a second or whatever. Let's go over all the cameos because I guess that's kind of a big thing about this movie. Let's just boil b- break down all of the characters that showed up in this from previous movies. I think I've I've wrote down everyone, but if I've missed anyone, feel free to point them out. So the first thing I wrote down is, and this is a big one because I brought it up when we talked about Jane Silent Bob Strike Back. Justice has a kid. It's somehow Jay's, even though, as I said in that episode, you never see them have time to have snuck off and had sexy times. IMO. And they definitely do it. In, they didn't do it in prison, as we theorized in that episode. We brought that up as a theory. Because in this movie, they mentioned how Jay never actually came to visit her. So they got they got dirty somehow. And I'm, I, I'm still just like, okay, what? I mean, it's not that super important. It's just weirdly annoys me. And then we, we find out that Justice now has, uh, so is also now married, I think, or they just partner. I can't remember if they said married or it's probably not important, but uh, with this. Oh, she, so she's married to the. She's married to her? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. she's now married to this lady called Reggie, who's played Rosario Dawson, who's not returning as a character from Clerks 2, which so made bad. that all even more confusing. I'm like, why have her come back, but not actually be Dante's wife in the fucking well, that, movie? That's just like Jason Lee. He's like four different characters in, in the. Uh, I know, universe. but I got so excited when I saw the trailer and I thought <laughs> about the idea of those two like having a happy life and we got to see their married life with kids and whatever. Maybe they're saving that for Clerks 3, obviously, but yeah. I, mean, I think I was disappointed because I built it up in my head from the trailer being like, man, Rosaria's back. We're going to see the Hicks family. <laughs> maybe it's the same character. <laughs> maybe something happened. She's had to go into witness protection, change her name, and the oh, events of the shit. fallout has made her, you know change team maybe that was maybe that was the plot of clerks three <laughs> it was like, that's, why it was, <laughs> that's why it was so super dark and stuff um so yeah that's that's the the justice history then we have holden show up holden yes. now also has so this is the thing everyone has kids in this and everyone's married and every, everyone's like settling down and th- that's like kind of a theme apart from a couple characters holden now shows up he has a kid technically um it's with Alyssa. Because he was the one who donated sperm. Now I tried to look up the official wording for this, and I couldn't find the official wording. Like, do you, I don't know what you call a, like, what, what do you refer to as the kid? Do you call this a, a sperm donor kid? Like, he's had a yes. Holden has had a sperm donated child with Alyssa. Is that I don't know if that's correct wording or not, but yeah. So you, in terms of the of the exact details, yeah, that's what he's done. So he is the yes. <laughs> yes. He's the sperm donor. So he, their co-parenting was the name that they that they used yeah. in the movie. Yeah. yeah. And Alyssa's with, uh, got a girlfriend or wife as well. It wasn't the same girl from the end of Chasing Amy, though. It was a different girl. Yeah. Unless I was like, okay, it's the same character, but different actress. But I'm pretty sure it was a completely different character. And that was really cool. And we can swing back to that one in a moment because that's, I, I, I feel like do. everyone will be, that, that's the scene everyone's talking about. But Brody owns a comic book store. But it's now uh, in the mall still. That's where it was originally, right? It was in the mall always. No? Uh, I don't think was it was somewhere in the mall, else. no. So he's moved it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
So Brody now owns a comic book store in the mole, but the mole is going under and it's now only has real rats in it, not mole rats. Ha ha. Yes. Golf clap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Loki is a born again Christian, I think was the reveal of the, like something along those Reborn lines. again. Matt Dane. Reborn. Yeah. Reborn, Reborn again. Matt Dane. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the, the one minute of him on screen. I was like, okay, sure. Um, and then Dante is still working at the convenience store, obviously. But most importantly, we find out in an after credit sequence that Jay has been the one putting the gum in the locks throughout this entire movie saga. I love that reveal so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's, well, I was like, is there going to be something? I'm sitting through the credits, sitting through the credits, sitting through the credits. And then it just comes back to just have like that 10 seconds of, Hit, pointing out the fact that he's the one who's been putting gum in the locks this entire time. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I'll, I'll pay it. That was decent. Um, so out of all, ha, uh, have I missed anything? Does anyone, is there any other uh, Yeah, so you missed the return of Diedrich Bader. Uh, he was the security guard from Jay and Silent Bob Strike oh. Back. Yeah, so he was back, which was fantastic. Anyone else? Uh, running through my head now. Hang on. Let me have a quick, let me have a quick think. <laughs> Uh, what's uh, buddy? Which one of these uh, grabs your attention? You want to talk about first? Justice, Holden, Brody, Loki, Dante. Which which of the cameos was most the best to you? Brody. Yeah, yeah. I love Brody. So, how do you feel about Brody showing back up and where his character is at now in the universe? <gasps> I think it's okay. uh, it's it's a bit weird considering the post credit scenes um, from More Rats, you know, where he's the late night show host and everything. Um, but in I guess. More groundedly, you would expect this kind of character to be running a comic book store in a mall. You know, kind of what <laughs> the same kind of this circle of life, you know, or come full circle for this kind of character. And it was actually, I think, it was my favorite kind of part of the movie as well. Um, when they're throwing back to uh, Strikes Back, when they're doing the whole the? at the computer, <laughs> you, <laughs> you don't know what a reboot. You don't know what a reboot is. Well, let me explain. And they're doing all that yeah. kind of thing that Affleck was doing. Um, that was, I think, that was my favorite part of the movie. It's nearly shot for shot, I think, like from the camera angles yep. and everything. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So it makes it better. Uh, a couple other cameos that we missed. We missed. Uh, so this is where it's going into the expanded uh, Kevin Smith universe. So we have uh, Justin Long returning as Brandon St. Randy. That's the character from Zack and Mary Make a Porno. Uh, I love that character so is much. Is it the same character? It is. They can't say it is because it's under a different uh, uh, distribution. Like the IP of Zack and Mary is owned by someone else. But it is Justin Long playing Brett Brand and St. Randy wow. and as vaguely as they could get away with it. Uh, and there's a bunch of other addition cameos, but in terms of viewer skew universe Kevin Smith characters, there's not many more. Uh, we see uh, we see his wife, Jennifer Schwalbach, return. However, she's playing uh, Miss McKenzie, which no, uh, no, no. believes to be one of the, the mother of one of the characters in Yoga Hoses. Oh, so, so he's tying a, in, he's a tying in the there. whole universe is now. Yeah, You've pretty got the much. Extended Kevin Smith universe, not just the viewer skew universe. <laughs> this is the season finale, but Kevin. In, Don't do this to us. <laughs> but in terms of others, because there's a bunch of other characters in there that are actors that rock, rock up. So like Craig Robinson is in there. Uh, let's see who else we got. We got Ralph Garman. If you're a fan of uh, Kevin Smith stuff, you know exactly who he is. Uh, Adam Brody, which was cool. Uh, that's it. And the one that I'm, I'm just waiting to last because I want to hear what Buddy has to say about this. <laughs> Le Champion, Chris Jericho, is in Jane Saw Bob Reboot. Yeah, did Fantastic. you like that, Buddy? Because before, <laughs> before you had watched the movie the last week or whenever it was, and I watched it before you, I was like, now Chris Jericho seems so funny in the movie. I was like, hurry up, watch it. So did you like it? Yeah, I really liked Chris Jericho. And, um, I didn't know kind of what the cameo was going to be. So this kind of far out of left field, or I guess I just should say right field with the type of group that he is uh, playing ah. with, um, <laughs> was really, you know, really obscure. And even though he's kind of a bad guy in all of the wrestling universes and, and leagues that he's, he wrestles in and portrays himself as a, as a character, uh, it was just funny to see, see him uh, in the role <laughs> that he was in, in this and actually get some kind of decent lines was, was funny as well. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that whole mm. um, his coming, and I know he's supposed to be in Kevin Smith's love one he shot as well. Apparently, so I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but 
Um, the horror one or whatever. So that'll be uh, what mo- was it? Moose Jaws? Uh, no, that hasn't shot yet. Else. Okay, different one. Um, I know there was a photo of them they put up on Instagram, so I was like, okay, don't know if this is coming out soon given current world events, but um, all right, Ryan, do you yes. want to talk about Holden? Oh my god, okay, <clears throat> by far the greatest part of this whole fucking movie. Um, <laughs> so the the scene that is most pivotal is yeah when we so- finally get to see uh Jay and Simon Bob re- re- you know reunite with uh, Holden McNeil, which the scene just feels like Kevin Smith and Jason Mewes meet catching up with Ben Affleck for the first time in years. The entire vibe of that scene is old friends that just finally were able to get together. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Now I, knowing myself, like the, the, the history behind the scenes of the, the relation between Kevin and Ben and how it's been so long. And the second that I spotted him in the film, I, I I'll admit I fucking cried. I, I was so happy to see it. And, and then what he happens to deliver in that scene is this incredible monologue about becoming a father and the importance of being a father and all these other things, which resonate with me as well. Like it's, it's absolutely tremendous. And Ben Affleck bangs the living crap out of it. It's just, Oh, I love that scene so much, so, so much. And then little subtle things because uh, the, the the child that uh, of Alyssa and, and Holden's is Jay's, child. is Jay's child, so it's Logan. Uh, and the whole time you can see Jay just, Best messing about with her on shot, and like I think that that's like that's real Jay there, you know. And I absolutely love, it. I love that scene so so much. It's so interesting too because when they like when they announced he was going to be in it, I expected a ten second cameo, honestly, or something like that. Same. And then hearing about like how it came together behind the scenes of Kevin not wanting to get in contact, and then finally someone pushing him to reach out. And then Ben basically being like, yeah, man, I can come do that. I'll fly in tomorrow and I'll shoot it. So like, in, it, it, in short, the issue was with um, Ben Affleck's ex-wife, Jennifer Garner, who who had an issue with Kevin Smith. So as a result, they weren't able to um, to hang out, socialize, work together as like they used to. So I think it was more like as the time grew longer, Kevin was more reluctant to reach out. And- Fuck, I'm glad he did. <laughs> I was about to say, and friends, that sometimes, you know, you just got to be the one to reach out and touch somebody kind of thing. Um, buddy, how do you feel about the scene with Holden? Yeah, it was fantastic. Like Ryan was saying, I agree. It was the most pivotal scene and monologue in the movie to kind of make Jay realize what was most important in his life at that time. I absolutely loved Affleck at the end when he's like, there he goes. He's gone, girl. Yeah, they're gone out on the town. And he started like naming all these Ben Affleck movies. I'm like, this is stupid. Now they've brought, <laughs> now they've done what you've said before. They have this sentimental monologue, and then they just kind of uh, end it all with this, you know, funny, <laughs> funny humor moment. So I'm just like losing it. So I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't mind that part because honestly, I began wondering if that was even part of the script or if <laughs> it was just Ben Affleck because he was with such the the, the young kid, obviously, just kind of messing around with her for you know on, on set kind of thing and it just fit into the movie i, do, I really do wonder if that was just part of the script or not because it, didn't, but it in, seemed it, like to add to what you're saying about the, the is that part of the script so this is the most uh, the most the, the interesting where kevin smith delivers exactly what he wants to say this is one of those moments we've seen them we've talked about it in the other films where there is a very clear moment where this is kevin smith addressing the audience and it's just mm. him getting everything out because the whole monologue is essentially the idea of, you know, I've done all these things and you know the 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 love of the past is fantastic and it's allowing me to continue my work, but I don't care about that anymore. I don't care about that. I want like I care about it as my kid and I want to see what she wants to do and and I want to be there for her and help support her and put her in the in the front of the stage and I'm going to take a step back to allow that and um oh it's so good the whole Bruce Wayne line was hilarious as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, the I, bomb is Batman. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed it too. I was, I, but again, I was just so surprised how how much they got to got him in it, and then also how much you learn about him and him and Alyssa and like what's happening. And now I'm kind of like, oh man, like I don't know if I want more movies of them, but God, I wish like we got more time. Like, <laughs> like they get they they gave they didn't give me. They gave me enough that I'm like, oh man, I want more now. <laughs> you should have gave me less, so I didn't. So I didn't want more kind of thing. Um, who who else was out of interest here? Does anyone? I don't think we really need to talk about justice. Obviously, 
the, the Loki thing, I'm like, the Loki um, thing is absolutely fantastic because it's just a punchline to a born joke, which I love. <laughs> it's like there's no there's no transition anywhere. There's no uh, there's no logical way you could put it in there. It's just like hi, I'm Lo- I'm Loki from Dogma, and here's a bunch of references. <laughs> the, the, yeah, and you know yeah, the, the uh, fucking Kevin's just right. sitting there high as fuck, just like. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> typing away these fucking puns. Jesus. But I love the exit because like, ah, oh, boom. All right, look, I'll narrate the start of the next scene because fuck it. And then yeah, and a nice then way never hear from again. <laughs> yeah. I was like, at, at that stage, I was like, okay, so is he, is he now the narrator in the movie? No, he's just, no. just, just, just there to segue <laughs> it in to get the born joke in. Fair enough. Um, yeah, and then um, Dante, we obviously don't get much time with. It's it's interesting though. We I will point out I did kind of enjoy the silly the silliest gag of the movie, which is them running into the the Comic Con set yeah. uh, panel things, obviously, which reminded me of when they ran through the sets of like Scream and everything in the original. I feel like that's the kind of parallel scene for this movie, since this is a reboot, of course. Um, and I did like how when they ran in, they're all in black and white up there yeah. on the the, the stage. I, I was like. This is the silliest part of this movie, but also I, I did laugh at that, so that was fun. Um, all right, so let's let's talk about the cracks then. So Jay and Silent Bob's um, storyline, and I say Jay and Silent Bob when really this whole movie is just about Jay. Like Bob's there as he usually is. However, he's even more so than ever. I feel kind of pushed to the side. Um, it, like there's not Kevin is really not interested in growing that character to be anything more than just what he is, and that's just this side character person that he gets to play and have fun with his friend. But it also means that we get the most amount of Jay storyline we've ever had in any of these movies, obviously. Um, and when when you knew going in, he's going to have a kid, you know, from the trailer, and this is a reveal and everything, everything along that. So I guess the the key question I have is did you enjoy Harley Quinn Smith playing Jay's daughter? I personally thought she did a great job. I actually quite enjoyed her in that role, right? Yeah, I agree. I have no major issues with it. Uh, I, You know, I think she's great. Like, uh, Yoga Hoses as much as being her first really big role, I'm not a big fan of that movie overall. No, um, no, but-, but her performance in here was, yeah, was pretty fantastic for someone that's done very minimal in terms of previous work uh and the benefit of of essentially working opposite her dad and her uncle jay like there is a comfortability there that is is coming across um i think that really helped plays that role and really allowed her to sort of open up in those more emotional scenes yeah, and you get the fun, did you, when they have the goofs in the credits. Like, there's several funny parts there where you can tell she's like really trying, but then she kind of is like, "Can you stop fucking around?" Like to <laughs> her own dad and Jay, like just take it seriously, kind of thing. Because I, I like whenever you hear stuff about her, you can tell that she's not like, "Oh, daddy's just put me in the movie." She wants to be a real actress. That's like kind of the career she's chosen for herself, I guess. And of course, she's privileged to be able to get the the jump in jump start into that however i do i do feel like she's not just doing it because her dad's chucking her in movies because she's showing up in you know tarantino's movies over here and whatever else so she's she's, she's out there um buddy how do you feel about her yeah i thought she was fantastic and once again i agree with you ryan pretty much verbatim that comfortability factor and uh as a viewer kind of knowing the relationship that she's kevin's daughter and you know uncle jay and and having it kind of flipped in the movie even when Jay's kind of looking at her or realizing, you know, oh my God, this is my daughter that you know, I, had, I had missed out on this relationship with. Even when he's kind of longing to kind of make up for that, even you still get that kind of natural chemistry or vibe between the two of them anyway, because they are mm. in essence family in real life. So I thought she was, yeah, I, I thought she was fantastic. And um, yeah, it was probably the, you know, once again, I didn't like yoga houses as well. And like you were saying, Dylan, she's been in a, a couple of things here or there. I'd really like to see what she can kind of do outside of the guise of, you know, being Kevin Smith's daughter or being in Kevin Smith movies and kind of- yeah, Or his see, friends, because we know Tarantino's a mate of his, so it's like- Yeah, yeah. And, and and see what she can kind of do and, and maybe with, you know, a little bit more, uh, I guess, better, more- <coughs> dramatic material instead of being just in these these kind of you know her dad's comedy so, movies so with that though her role is very serious yes like she's yes. not really there for the comedy at all and in a lot of ways i feel like 
he, her own father didn't even bother trying to write comedy for her because he was like, yeah, she can't do that. I'll, just, I'll make sure the <laughs> character's just dramatic, you know. Yeah. There's no point trying to give her too many jokes. She won't be able to pull them off kind of thing. Because mm. um, even the more dramatic characters throughout the history of the show have always had a couple jokes here, here, here and there, but really she's just very much fucking serious. And she's got a super dark history, of course, and um, whatever else. How, how do we feel about her friend group, though? Because that's, that's my one kind of, uh, I wasn't a big fan of like, it seemed like they were just kind of caricatures of lots of different, and they're like chucked together. I'm I like, do oh, feel I that was the point. Trip. I do feel that was commentary on, or very, not like incredible commentary, but like pretty on the nose commentary of uh, of reboot culture. Uh, in terms of like, okay, we've got the, we've got an ensemble cast, and we're going to hit all these demographics. I think that's what they he was trying to get at, perhaps. Possibly, yeah. And, and I, I think mean, it, later on in the movie, when the kind of the staffer comes down from the panel, goes, "Yeah, you know, Kevin Smith apparently talked to this girl, and they want all you diverse people yeah. in the front row <laughs> up, 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 up on the stage." And this, those are probably my favorite moments in the movie. Like I was saying before about Brody and how he's explaining reboot reboot versus remake and Hollywood culture and how there's no original ideas anymore. And once again, like you were just saying before, that kind of is that a smart way of kind of showing the kind of diversity um, stuff that's happening in Hollywood at the moment? And yeah, I, I I thought it was pretty much when when they when he made that comment towards the end of the movie, I'm like, was this did he did he make this happen on purpose? And this is kind of he's kind of tying the the bow on that kind of um, commentary. Mm. Uh, that's kind of how I came across it as well. Yeah. That- that would make sense, I guess. Never, re- I don't know. If I, was, I just missed that one, but um, I <laughs> when you're saying that stuff, do remind me of the whole Brody thing about the reboot and stuff culture? Because I just remembered it was quite funny how Kevin's like a known massive Marvel fan, and then he puts in the <laughs> whole part where Brody's like complaining. He's like, "Fucking Hollywood's gonna kill itself. No original ideas anymore." And then Jay is like, "Yeah, these fucking Marvel movies. Don't you dare talk about those Marvel <laughs> movies. They are my life." <laughs> I was like, that is, yeah. So it's like he's aware of how silly it is to, you know, kind of complain about no <laughs> original content and then b- make a reboot and also love Marvel movies. They make all these extended universes so that people have to go see the next movie and then yeah. all these fans get upset and angry when they're just seeing the yeah. same processed ideas. Yeah, yeah, like this, that. Yeah, well, man, that was so good. But to, to add to that, how are you? What? how do you guys feel about – Kevin Smith making fun of reboot culture while also exploiting reboot culture in the same film. I mean, I think you can you can you can you can pull off a joke and be very just open that you're like you're. I mean, it's not really the same. He's not part of the problem. Like you can't compare mm. reboot to like rebooting <clears throat> Jaws, Back to the Future, fucking Star Wars. You know, like some massive franchise where it's an actual quote unquote problem if that's how you want to put it. Like, making a reboot of Jay and Silent Bob, because it's not even actually a reboot. That's the thing, I guess. That's an important difference. Like, it's it's a sequel. It's a continuation, even though it does kind of follow the same story structure and tell a similar sort of story, and he calls it a reboot. It's not actually a reboot. Mm. Or it's it's not even a reboot or a remake. It's just a it's a, it's a joke. I think the it's a joke. It's all part of the joke. Yeah, it's 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 meta. It's in the in joke. And the difference here is, I guess, the fans of this franchise are actually wanting this movie and Kevin Smith to make it, and more Jay and Silent Bob. Whereas maybe in other franchises, you know, who wanted a Point Break remake? You know, at one point they wanted Ronda Rousey in a Roadhouse remake. It's you know th- those things failed, and their commentary on the Fast and the Furious. <laughs> I, I, although I guess in that kind of universe, maybe people are yearning for more of that. That's kind of more fire than maybe some of the more other examples where people didn't want something to be get remade or, or rebooted and stuff. So, Cool. If you're enjoying this podcast, you can listen to It's About Family, our Fast and Furious podcast on the ExplosionNetwork.com. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for not reminding a, me, not, buddy. Now no affiliation here. I do not support or endorse the words of one uh, Dylan Blight. Uh, my views on the Fast and the Furious Um uh, not shared with anyone else on this panel. So, oh, I'm. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm very much aware that you're not a fan of the 
franchise. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> feel askew. So, they, how's it, let's talk about where they kind of end up, of course. So that's if we need to see Jay and Bob show up in any future movies, if there is future movies. And then I want to ask if, if like what you want Clerks 3 to look like and what you think it'll look like and et cetera, et cetera. But s- starting with Jay and Bob, at the end of this movie, it very much seems like Jay, I guess, is getting weekends with his daughter and they're hanging out in front of <laughs> convenience stores and that's how he's using his bonding time and whatever else and that's quite funny and it's sweet and of course that that that's the, the crux of it all. Where it goes from there, who knows? But at this point, if they do Clerks Free, if they do a Mallrat series, do you think that like Jay and Bob are still in the background and they're showing up now with Harley there playing the kid, tagging along for fun? Or do we just get rid of Jay and Bob from the franchise and be like, well, they're done with all the shenanigans now? Because then it would be like, that would be really fucking weird to watch a viewers queue movie without Jay and Bob making at least one cameo. So, Ryan, what do you what do you reckon? Well, because in terms of what Clerk, because uh, I, I, I'm obviously more excited for a Clerks 3 rather than the More Rats miniseries. I think More Rats miniseries will still be interesting, but Clerks 3 is what I'm most excited for. I want to see where Dante and and Randall are at now. So with the idea that that uh, Clerks 1 was Kevin Smith and, you know, the idea is they're, they're in their 20s, Clerks 2 is they're in their 30s, now they're in their 40s. Like, I want to see where they move towards now. I want to see, yeah, Becky and, and their kid, you know, their kid between with Dante. I want to see if Randall has a partner because when there was a time they would link uh, expressing ca- uh, casting calls for a partner for Randall. Like I want to see where these guys are because it, it you know close to does end on them running the quick stop and being happy and this is what they realized that they wanted to do. However, uh, I still want to see where that is because I think as you mentioned before, dealing the idea of growing up with this with this universe, the Dante and Randall are where it began and I want to see where they're at now because. You know, I've related to Dante and Randall at different parts in my life, and I want to see where I sit with them now. It's totally selfish, but I want to see where I sit with them now. So in terms of Jay and Silent Bob being in there, I do think we will see them in there, but I th- it maybe they will continue to be like a – they'll become like maybe like more of a point of reason. You know, like, hey, I've I've got a kid now, and I'm doing this and that, and like, what are, what are you doing? That would right? actually be funny that you're saying, and I can pitch that. I guess, yeah. That would yeah, be like funny. Randall, maybe yeah, Dante's behind the counter still complaining about not having to be there today, even though he owns the joint. And he's like, what the fuck you doing, man? Like, I got a kid. I got responsibilities and shit. And you're sitting here still bitching and whinging like it's 1995. <laughs> you, you've sold me. I'm done. Let's end, let's end the show. <laughs> I changed my whole thought process. That actually makes heaps of sense. Uh, buddy, how do you feel? Um, I don't care to see any of these characters ever again. Uh, as harsh as that sounds, people are going to listen to this like, <laughs> oh, buddy's such a hater. Does he even like Kevin Smith or any of these movies? I think growing up and outside of Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, which I only really watched in full last year when we were recording for this, I'd seen parts of it. I think I'm kind of, it was, the best example I can pull out is Harold and Kumar. Okay, I saw that movie in 2004. I was in year 12. It was hilarious. I loved it at the time. Four years later, I go to the cinema, I see Guantanamo Bay, and I'm in the cinema and there are laughs everywhere, and I'm just really, I'm, I feel like I'm past that humor, and I don't know with how these characters have evolved, and some of them have got happy endings, whether we can keep coming back to this well, and whether this fan base kind of wants to keep going with it. I like Ryan's idea if they are going to continue to have that evolution and, you know, do, do do the family stuff, but I don't know what kind of legs that has in sense of those characters and how they've evolved and instead of just, oh, look, we're shooting this movie and all of a sudden they're there or we're going to get 90 minutes or uh, two hours. they can't be and, drug dealers at 40. be fucking weird. Yeah, so <laughs> if they're going to continue with this, I would actually like them to see, which is funny because they've just had a, a movie called Reboot that we're kind of talking about right now. I would actually like to see maybe it get rebooted. And by that, I mean, maybe let's start fresh and have some new characters and get some young talent in. Maybe you can have his daughter, Harley Quinn Smith, if she's going to continue doing this route and, you know, kind of not do other stuff as a character that can kind of be the draw card for all these fans that love Kevin Smith and get all these other characters in. It gives you a great chance to kind of change the humor up as well without having the kind of baggage that you have with the Jay and Silent Bob and the dick and fart jokes. And maybe you could have your, maybe your slight cameos that are your, your 10 second type stuff, but this is your chance to get 
new characters and maybe a, a new kind of universe and stuff without being so obscure with all the tusk and the moose jaws and stuff. But um, really, at, at the end of the day, Kevin Smith is a guy that listens to his fan base and we've seen it through the podcasts and Tusk and warning them all rats and, and the clerks three and even even to a degree this movie. So I think it really comes down to the fan base and, and what they want and they will tell Kevin and more often than not he will probably listen, whether it's to, you know, his artistic or financial detriment or advantage. So yeah. What about if Jay's daughter starts working at the quick stop? <laughs> I don't then want to see this stuff ever again. <laughs> then she has to deal with her dad hanging outside of the store all day, being like, "Dad, can you not hang outside the store, please? This is very unbecoming." <laughs> but then we're stuck with uh, you know Jay still being in it and still having all this this history, it's true. And these jokes. You know, is he going to tuck his dick in again? Um, <laughs> which is one of my least favorite gags of the uh, of clerks too yeah and, that, uh, that that opening joke is really it opened rough. in reboot and i was like oh good. here we go this is not a good start especially with the, the fbi and the very loud really weird bad bad yeah. very bad dialogue really rough start to watching yes. this movie yes um yeah. only, <laughs> only fact that they reference buffalo bill and then you know get out here silence of the lambs bob then i thought oh, okay cool they've tied it into a joke that i think is funny fantastic but it was a, was a really rough start and um i don't know that's just my personal opinion of what i'd like to see if kevin smith is going to continue making movies and um with these type of characters or this kind of universe plan or, or a genre or whatever a strategy that you know is kind of prevalent here but whatever i'm i'm, I'm kind of happy if this is the the, the kind of the the bow title together on the cherry on top I think it's a, a good kind of finale for all of this. I I agree on... I don't personally want to see the quick stop ever again either. Like, watching a whole movie inside the quick stop, I'm like, that place seems kind of boring to me. And I like, one, I'd love... I, Clerks 2 is exciting because it's a new place, right? It's movies. Mm. This is new, fresh, exciting. However, I do want to see those characters again. I just kind of wish the whole movie, I, I just hope the movie isn't going to be, let's fucking spend a day in the quiet side of the quick stop. Like if, if Clerks 3 is barely in the quick stop and it's actually at their homes and in their lives and all that sort of stuff and it's more like a, a day or two inside their lives and you're following around and barely in the quick stop, I'd be like, oh, this sounds great. But yeah, it's, it's, the idea of spending a whole movie in the quick stop, I'm, I'm, I'm not super keen on. Uh, rebooting the whole franchise that sounds very scary. <laughs> like, just, yes, absolutely. The, sounds super scary. And as to the other point you said, like about, oh, Kevin Smith will do what his fans want. I, I do often wanna wonder, like as we're talking about here, my, we're all like, yeah, like some of the jokes are good, some of them are bad, whatever. But we're most interested in these characters. And it's, I don't even know if so many other fans may feel the same, but just never like say vocalize that, it. I guess, and vocalize it. And maybe Kevin's not even aware of that. Like, Especially because I would feel the majority of his fan base, like us, who were looking forward to this movie, you're not looking... Sh surely none of them are like, oh, man, I'm so excited to watch this movie for the dick and fire jokes. No, they're excited to watch it for the characters. So, like, at this point, everyone's coming to these movies for these characters. However, maybe Kevin's just not, like, aware of what his fan base actually wants from the characters at this stage, which is, as we're saying character progression and story and whatever else and not just seeing those characters do dick and fart jokes you know so he may not even be aware because his, his his majority of his fan base may not vocalize that they feel similar to us even if they do feel similar to us you know and that may yeah. be a a problem because then he feels like oh that's what people want but maybe it isn't i don't know you know it's hard it's three of us can't speak for the, <laughs> the you know millions <laughs> of people of course but um it, it's it, it's it's a it's a possibility um, and and the, before we, before point, we yeah. touch on it, with kind of listening to the feedback and whether the fans can actually vocalize it all, we are in a situation now where, oh my God, this is the greatest thing, I'm a fanboy, or this is trash, I hate it, this is pathetic, I'm a troll. There's yeah. never ever like a constructive middle, especially with the internet. Hmm. So even if mm -hmm. fans wanted to vocalize that, even though we have the biggest and best platform ever to do that, is there a way that people are going to be able to comprehend and actually get that out? Um, in the right manner for it to be able to materialize because it'll always get lost in the uh, the, ext you know, the extremes of hate and love as well of, of, well, of the product or it's weird calling it a product. Ugh. 
Yeah, not to go like too much of a sidetrack on that, but in general, I'd I'd say like if if you were to try and say that on a forum, an open forum where there was a chance of Kevin seeing it, all of his fan base would potentially jump on you and shut you down for being a hater, right? But the thing is, like to, to your like constructive criticism or whatever, the whole thing of this podcast, the whole reason we did it is because we're like, we love these movies. Like, so, like sure, some of us feel some aren't that great. Some love other ones than others or whatever. But in general, the whole idea of this podcast was we really like these movies. We're going to talk about them. And here we're being very critical about the the, the movie somewhat, discussing its ups and downs. But in no way does that ever mean that we, we're suddenly haters in a movie. But yeah, so mm. it's, it's really weird. If the only people who are super loud and vocal in any sort of fan base, and in this example, obviously, it's the Kevin Smith fan base, if the only people he ever hears are the super fanboys telling him everything that he ever did is great, and this is the same for any director, writer, fucking anything, if the people they only ever pay attention to and or see because of how forums like Twitter and whatever are set up because you'll only see the top comments and who's going to get the most likes people saying oh my god Kevin this is the best thing ever they get all the likes they go to the top if anyone has anything else to say no one's going to like them you won't see them you won't hear them so yeah I mean that's that's a problem with fandom in general yeah. I think what you're yeah, talking about because everyone would be the more the more happy vocal fan presuming that that would come to the top of the list and that was what would get seen by Kevin you know what I mean like so it would be that uh, uh, acknowledgement that uh, what's what I'm looking for the um Gratification. Gratification. Thank you of, of of having Kevin read and you know engage with your comment, and it's more likely he'll comment with you being incredibly lovely compared to hey dude like here's this. Yeah, like if if we wanted this thing to to be even more popular, we should have just done an eight episode series where every movie were like this is the best movie ever. Yeah, just like suck suck his for like eight episodes. Yeah, like sucked sucked his dick for eight fucking episodes and then like shared it around and be like, hey, Kevin Smith fan base shared us around, and yeah, maybe we would have got we would have got sent the movie early. <laughs> I don't know. Like, and, <laughs> and I think a great recent example of that. I know you don't want to hear these words um, at all, Dylan. Give you some kind of suppressed memory and rec- recollect that, but it's actually with Star Wars and how. The, the feedback yeah. from <laughs> The Last Jedi and, you know, kind of listening to what people did and didn't like and trying to really change that in The Rise of Skywalker. And it really felt like that was a shotgun approach. And instead of having kind of, here's our vision, here's our focus, trying to kind of listen to too many voices and where you don't actually kind of, you know, hit implement the proper strategy or, or hit what you're trying to achieve. So, yeah. Yeah, and and like not to go deep on it because obviously I did like three hour podcast talking about how much I dislike that movie, but that is a case where it does seem the vocal minority didn't like the movie and then they all gathered to like those comments on Reddit or Twitter or whatever. So then uh, if you were neutral on the subject, it seemed like everyone hated it because all the top comments would be people shitting on The Last Jedi, Mm. right? And that's no different than what we're talking about here. If everyone's like, oh, I love this movie, Kevin, and everyone likes that, like the super fanboys like that and get shot to the top. Or if anyone's like, hey, James Silent reboot was pretty great, enjoyed it, but maybe next one you focus a little bit more on the characters because that's kind of what we're into now. And they're like, no, <laughs> we will not like your co- comment or your podcast. Get the this hell guy out hates of here, it. <laughs> He said, focus on something else. He hates it. No, 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 no. He hates it. Tell him Steve Dave. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Tie that one in. (laughs) Think because a guy reads some comics and doesn't know how to start some shit. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) There is a Vilsky joke for every occasion. Um, All right, let's go on to the next thing. So, of course, uh, every other episode... Ask what everyone's favorite moment is. And I, I'm going to say I know that this one's not as loved in our history, so it may be hard to pick one. Although I'll put Ryan on the spot first because he's the person who's seen it twice. So he gets to uh, pick, say, what 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 was and is, do you reckon, your favorite moment? Is it the... It is, um, the, it is the Holden, the Holden, Holden scene. Yeah, unquestionably. Um, there And probably a close second would be there is... Because <clears throat> there, there were a couple of moments with uh, Harley Quinn and uh, and Jay, sorry, Millie and Jay uh, talking about the, addressing the father issue. There was That's, one. There's one. One of those is my favorite. From yeah. The so there's the first one which they do in the van, which gets interrupted by the dumbest shit and not even the good dumbest shit. Like that was a perfect example of a really heartfelt moment ruined by a bad joke. Where there's a second one later on, which is after the Holden scene, and that is. That is exceptional. Brilliant. So that's probably like a close two. Buddy, what's your favorite? 
Yeah, the Brody cameo and kind of the callback <coughs> to the Ben Affleck character explaining the internet to the boys uh, with this time being the difference between the remake, reboots and, and kind of Hollywood. And I really love that kind of Kevin Smith using that as a uh, an avenue <laughs> to kind of take a dig at Hollywood itself and even, you know, poke a little bit of fun uh, at himself and the whole kind of premise of what the movie's about. So um, what I was trying to really say about the uh, the kind of industry and the meta nature of it, not the when they turn to the camera. I don't really like those moments in it. Like the, It had to be included. because It had to be included, but <laughs> more so the messaging and what they're saying. Um, no, I, I like that. The, that was kind of my favorite part. Yeah, so I, my favorite one is the moment where she starts breaking down what, like, exactly the, 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 the reason they're going on this whole trip and everything. And she basically starts screaming at Jay and being like, I don't know my dad, never knew my dad. And she's, like, in tears and... Everything like that. Because that was the moment I was like sitting here. I started tearing up in that scene. That was the moment where I was like, whoa, we're going somewhere. I was like, well, I started getting like big hopes for this movie. And I was like, I wouldn't say I was let down. Like they, they kind of, they, they they shot it. They overshot shot the mark a little bit, but they got close to, you know, landing a home run here for that. But it was it was in that scene where I was like, wow, okay, this, this is, I'm, I'm getting touched somewhere. And it's, it's, it's in my heart bones over here. That's what's happening. But yeah, it's, it's, it's that scene where I was like, she was really great. And like Jay was great in that scene. And, I'm like there. There is a, I mean that's the core heart of the movie. I guess like that that scene sets up what the whole movie is about. And it, it obviously knew they were family before that point, but from that point on in the movie, you know deep down that this movie is going to be about Jay realizing that this girl needs him and she needs her dad because they could they could have had a different movie where she's like, "Fuck my father, I don't need my father," and then the the movie becomes about him proving that she needs. <coughs> She needs him for some reason, and that pro- would have been a stupid movie because it would be like, dude, she's like fucking nearly an adult. She don't need you now. So you missed out on her life. But the the the, the story is, here's this girl. She's grown up without her dad, and then it, it, as old as she, how old is the character supposed to be? Like fucking 17, 18. 16, 20, I don't know. Yeah. 18, 18 years, yeah. eighteen years. Oh. Um. So she's yeah. The story is eighteen year old who could very well be like, no, I don't need my dad at this stage. But instead, she's still longing for that father relationship so i've been um, i've been in that situation where you know I've, I've been that kind of age and had parents come back into my life that have not been there and i've had to make that decision myself whether I, is this a relationship that i've kind of longed for and missed out on and want to reconnect with um my i guess strange parents or do i you know what's in my life now is is what i have and i don't want to really jeopardize that and um that's my family now so i've all i've all that's that kind of resonates with me and in, in, in that kind of well i was, I was gonna decision. say without getting too personal how did how do you feel about that being touched upon in, in this movie do you think they I delivered like it, it in a very real way uh <clears throat> yes and no i guess um in in my own personal situation i didn't feel like i missed out on having a relationship with family because my nan and pop were my family and they were my parent figures so when it came to my decision as as an adult um, when trying to reconnect with, I guess, parent figures or those parent figures trying to be re- re- reconnect with me, uh, I already had my decision in, in play. These were already not good people in my life. So uh, being a biological mother or father really had no relevance to me. I had my family and I knew what that meant to me. So that was the decision I made. Obviously, with this character, with Harley Quinn Smith, you know, she has felt like she has missed out on something and growing up it has been uh, a void that she's been trying to fill. So it's a completely kind of different situation from what I was in because I had that void filled by my nan and pop who were those parent figures. So I can totally see it um, from when someone is that age where they could want to reconnect and, and have that relationship. And I can also see it from my perspective because I've, I've lived through it and uh, not wanting to do that. So, yeah, I think it's a, a realistic kind of, um, thing to have because you know, so many people when you know they're absent from uh, a parent and from a child perspective as well or even from a parent's perspective they're like well shit I'm not going to be around them while they're growing up are they not going to want to be a part of my life and at least in this situation you can see that perspective from her that she has always wanted that and she got it I uh, got the opportunity to kind of uh, have a chance at that so it definitely yeah, thanks, uh, a thanks realistic for sharing perspective. Them, man. That was cool. I guess no, it's it's always going to come down like person to person. But I also like appreciate within the movie that like, it's it's not like oh 
justice is raising her in a horrible family. <clears throat> so that's the reason she's always had this longing for her father. It is simply that <clears throat> for whatever reason, deep down inside, she's just always missed it. And other people in the same exact scenario that she was in may have just been like, I'm good, you know? And it's, and it's just going to vary person to person. Yeah. And especially so it's like if you with- were her... <laughs> you might have been like, no, I'm good, Jay. <laughs> especially with the type of character that Jay is and the kind of, you know, he's been in yeah, trouble yeah. with the law and, you know, drug dealer yeah. and all this stuff. And um, it come down to, you know, we might be biological f- family or whatever, but are you a good person? Do I want to know you? Do I want you to be a part of my life? So from that perspective, I'm like, mm, that's just a Hollywood thing. Maybe maybe more realistic. Like, I can yeah, look at that yeah. person and go, yeah, nah, you're not a good influence. Um, I've been way better off without you, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these movies are like fantasy, really. So, yes, but, of yeah, course. Re- realistically, if I was in her scenario and my, at, like, I'm 18 and my dad turns up and it's Jay, and like, hey, fucking, I sell drugs. You want to come up? Be like, nah, dude. I'm good. <laughs> Probably I'm good. You know, like, and it's, I have, I, in high school, I knew two people whose fathers were in prison until they were 16, 17 ish or something like that. And one of them, really wanted to connect with their father when he got out of prison and the other one wanted nothing to do with him. And they were both. So, you know, it really does very, 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 depress- but I like the way they present it in this movie. Cause I have seen other movies where yes. they, 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 they present it as if the, the child really needs the father in the, or the mother or mm-hmm. whoever it is in their mm-hmm. life, because that's their position. And that in the, the law of the world, everyone requires their parents to be in their, their life because that's how life works. And I, I never really liked that story. Mm-hmm. It's like, it, it, it differs. I don't know why everyone, you know, especially if they're in a loving home anyway, it's like, Yes, yeah. I've seen a lot of movies, movies where, where I like, hate that story. <laughs> yeah, You're like they're in a loving home. Why they? Why does this seem so? You know. Anyway, yeah. So I like the way they represent that. Yep. Um, I was I was forgot how we even got here, but yeah, that was I was pointing out favorite my favorite scenes. scene, right? Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> um, that one? I know yeah. we're kind of wrapping up soon, but I'd like to kind of touch yep. on something we I think we might might have overlooked. I, I haven't seen the show notes or anything, but Kevin Smith actually being in this movie. And being the director of the reboot (laughs) and how kind of really meta that was and how he is actually a part of this universe as a as a character himself now. So I thought that was quite um, funny in itself. So does that then put that in this real world, this current world? Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's a documentary. (laughs) (laughs) So apparently from like putting together the pieces, it seems that was supposed to be Stan Lee. Yeah, I think so too. Mm. Is the is the the going word because there was all this stuff about him saying Stan Lee was supposed to be in it. Um, he asked him to do it. There was this clip of them talking about it on the IMDb yes, uh, Comic Con live show and all this other stuff. And he was supposed to be in it. And then obviously when he passed away horribly, um, they he didn't pass away. Role. He passed away sadly. He didn't pass away horribly. Sadly. Like he was well, old. You, so you just made me picture. It was a horrible event. <laughs> You just made me picture Indiana Jones and the Last Cru- Crusade. Stan Lee is drinking from the Holy Grail. That's not the Holy Grail. What are you doing? <laughs> Stan Lee passed away, sadly. <laughs> Let me correct myself on that one. Um, yes, but I, I, I believe that was who he was supposed to play, which would have been quite interesting to obviously watch Stan Lee do that role. I thought that Kevin choosing to do that role and play that and make the movie like really super meta. Um, It worked for me because like he really poked a lot of fun at himself and he could tell he was having fun with it. And it's only right at the end, you know, like he's got a small dick. It worked. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's, I mean, it worked for me. I had absolutely no problems with it personally. It worked. It worked for me as well. and, And especially tying it in with my favorite part, like I said before about the kind of poking fun at Hollywood, I think. You know, this being even more fourth wall breaking and having that kind of meta jokes in it was even more. He makes fun. himself out to be a, a an a bigger asshole than what I think most people mm. believe him to. You know, everyone believes him to be a nice guy, and yet in this, he makes him out makes himself out to be a bit of an asshole, especially with the scene of him like walking up to take your pitch, like "Get over here, fucking kid!" and like you know, like all this <laughs> all this stuff with the extras and what, all that sort of stuff. So that was it's fun. It's like a heightened version of Kevin Smith, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and it's been, and a little throwback in that scene. I did really enjoy that. Oh, Marvel's going to sue somebody. So a throwback yeah. to Strike Back, which I enjoy. Uh, 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 guys, we forgot to mention Chris Hemsworth. Oh, right, yeah. Hey, yes. I'm Chris Hemsworth. 
Do not touch the thing. Yeah, don't don't hump the statue. It's <laughs> it's, it's fine. Statue, yeah. Everything. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I wonder how he manages to get certain people to do cameos, especially like Chris Evans or uh, Chris. Yeah, to record a Hemsworth to record a quick thing like that. Quite funny. I enjoyed it though. Especially because yeah, other right. girls, the other girls, basically the version of Jane. This movie, Jane, Jane. This movie is like very tame. He's never like, oh, I'm gonna f-. like. Apart from that one scene where he sees Justice, and he like has that whole like flashbacky <laughs> scene, which is obviously a throwback to the. It the was just him getting movie. pegged. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, like apart from that, Jane. This movie is like very calm, and the girls are actually the ones who are doing all the raunchy jokes. And I think that's part of the movie, of course, part of the fun of it. Like, especially that scene up front where they're talking about how much they, in the car, talking about how much they love Chris Hemsworth. And Jay's like, oh, you st- don't talk like that. Like, <laughs> that's disgusting. And I think that was obviously supposed to be a joke about how guys are allowed to be like, oh, fuck her hard and all that sort of stuff. And the second girls yeah. are like, oh, I love the fucking guys. They're like, oh, I don't, oh, don't, <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> that's disgusting. Yep. Um, so that was fun. Uh, any other, before we wrap up, any other random bits and pieces, scenes you just want to note that you're like, this was funny, this was great, thing and things? No? Um, one no? thing, I guess, more of a down note, um, the the gentleman that played the Uber driver, uh, I, 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 did yeah. he feel off to you guys as well? Like, I know he's got a dry delivery because he's been in a bunch that's- of other things. Yeah, that's how just how he is, I believe. Okay, like, yeah, that's like, how his comedy is. Yeah, none of it really landed for me, for me personally. Um, but I did enjoy the hater tots. That was a cool little thing to come out of that. I suppose it was nice and dumb. Yes. But uh, it fits the world of Kevin Smith making silly, like food related mm. uh, brand jokes into the viewer skew universe. Like, of course, movies is a big part, and all the other things like that. So you got like the, the hater tots. Of course, people didn't like them, and the right wing picked up on it. It's funny. <laughs> All right. So that will do it for the final episode of Radio Movies Season 1. Bung! That's right. There will be a second season. Uh, sometime in 2020, uh, we'll be back. Non-view askew movies. So that will be uh, get your pen and paper down. Start planning now. Jersey Girl. Zack and Mary make a porno, Cop Out, Red State, <laughs> Tusk, and Yoga Hoses. Those are the six films, which apparently are now part of the Kevin Smith universe. So I'm finding out during this episode, they've tied them all together. So it, it really does make sense for this podcast now. It's not just like, let's do the non-related ones. Let's do the other somewhat related ones now. So look forward to that sometime in the future. Um, you can find out when that's coming by just listening <laughs> in to In about feed, six or- months, apparently. That's... <laughs> Seems to be the cycle we're working on. <laughs> it'll it'll at least start this year. Um, you know, some of us may we all may get stuck at home. Even <laughs> required jobs may soon be not required, and the world goes into apocalypse, and we'll have all the time in the world. Who the fuck knows what could happen in the future? All right, so you can find Buddy Watson over at dashgamer.com, and you can be sure to follow him on Twitter's at Buddy Watson Twelve. You can find Ryan Betson over at youtube.com slash the pop culturist talking all things PlayStation on for the players and wrestling on the young and the wrestlers. You can follow him on Twitter at Haggard MC and you can find myself right here on explosionnetwork.com on one of our many movies, games, or TV podcasts like Arco Couch or What Do You Want to Watch? And you can follow me on Twitter at Viva Ladil. Please be sure to review this podcast on Apple Podcasts if you've enjoyed this season. And if you're looking forward to the follow-up stuff, you can tweet at Kevin Smith and tell him to listen to this for some true, great, actual feedback of what his true fans want out of future movies. That's right, true fans. Hashtag true fans. Last time, smoochie boochies. wrong. That kid is just way more interesting to me. You think, think life, life was, was all about, about me. me. I was, I was the hero of my own story. story. Bruce, Bruce Wayne, Wayne one, one lifelong issue of Detective, Detective Comics. Comics so to speak. speak. And, that and that kid came, came along and suddenly you realized you're not, you're not Bruce, Bruce Wayne, Wayne anymore. You're it's Thomas, Thomas Wayne. Wayne. Or Bruce, Bruce Wayne's, Wayne's mom. mom. Whose name escapes me. Escapes me. Anyway, I'm just here to set the real story in motion. Because once you become a parent, you're not the star anymore. You're the stage. I'm just here to prop up my kids so she can put on the show of her life, like my parents did for me, like theirs did before them. And if you're lucky enough to have a kid, the trade-off is you don't really get a third act to your story, because the story changes. All of a sudden, it's not about you anymore. For the first time in your self-involved life, that's okay. 
Kids are like our reboots. Another chance to tell a brand new version of the same old story. I know I'm supposed to be teaching Amy stuff, but I, it's like I'm learning from her every day. So, spend my days chasing Amy. <laughs>